Wow, thanks for coming back to visit A Fine Time for Healing. I am your show host, Randy Fine. It's so good to see all of you. I know that most of us have had pets in our lives and our pets are like our children. And it used to be years ago when a pet died, people were like, well, it was just an animal. But that's not true. Our pets are family members and it really hurts when they leave and their memories really stand out. So you, if you have a pet that's passed on or you're thinking about the pet that you have now and what will come with that pet, you're going to really, really love this show. Today we have with us Rob Guttrow, who is an author, paranormal investigator and medium with Inspired Ghost Tracking of Maryland. Since he was a child, he could receive messages from ghosts or spirits who have crossed over. As a scientist, he also provides some scientific explanations about how energy is the baseline for the afterlife and the medium that entitles him to entitles use to use to communicate. Um, in 2005, Rob's late puppy passed and inspired Rob to write his first book and enabled him to communicate with pets. Rob participates in private paranormal investigations, helps ghosts cross over, and has provided countless messages from people or pets as ghosts or spirits. He lived in a haunted house too. <laughs> That's great. Welcome, Rob. Hi, Randy. Thanks for having me today. Nice to be My here. pleasure. Wonderful, wonderful to have you. So you're a medium. Tell us about what your, um, I call them gifts. People that have these natural uh, mm -hmm. gifts don't always think they're gifts. Do you? Do you think you have a gift? Yeah, at first I didn't know what it was, but I realized that over time that it really is a gift because I use it to help people and bring them some comfort. Okay. And when did you first discover that you had this gift? Well, it was back when I was a teenager. It was kind of a, a shocking way to find out that you have a gift um, when uh, <laughs> when my dead grandfather showed up in front of me about seven months after he died in full color. And um, I was uh, I was alone in my home. My my parents were out. My brothers are out. I was with the well, I was with the family dog. And then and I looked up and I noticed the light and it was it was about nine o'clock at night. So it was dark in the summer. And there was my grandfather standing there and I grabbed that dog and I ran outside. <laughs> <laughs> so um, and that, and my, then, mom, my mom has the ability. So she, she confessed after I told her. Okay. <laughs> so she had the ability. It tends to run in families. It's kind of like a genetic thing, right? Yeah, Often. it seems to be. And it was all on my mother's side because she, my mom said that my grandfather, the one who appeared to me, also had some abilities. Hmm. Interesting. Well, so um, you're part of a paranormal team or you run a paranormal team, which I'm very familiar with because I've used them down here in Florida. Uh, oh. In my businesses, I've called in paranormal teams. I had um, my husband and I owned two spa-like places where uh, spirits tended to like to stay. Uh, oh. They, you know, they, um, I don't know if it was the smell or the music or whatever it was, but it, we tended to attract, it could have been me, <laughs> but we, atten we, in, we tended to attract some spirits, some malevolent, some benevolent. So, oh. We had both, um, but I would call in the paranormal team to get them out <laughs> or to get them, send them to the light. We had one we had to get out, but most of them we sent to the light. So um, I think it's a fantastic, interesting process. Okay. Yeah, um, <laughs> I've, I've been with them uh, since 2010 and I, I'm just one of the mediums. There are a couple of mediums on the team. Okay. And it was founded by Margaret Ehrlich back in 2008, who lived in a haunted house as a child. And that's what inspired her to found, to, uh, to found Inspired Ghost Strike. That's, that's so cool. They have the, the best equipment now. And I mean, there's all these things you can see that, that speaking acro comes across this little screen. It's just amazing to me. Um, have you always been able to see pets in the afterlife or was that something that happened more recently? That happened more recently. It happened in 2005. <clears throat> and the impetus for that was the tragic 
passing of my puppy, Buzz, who's a wine runner. His leash opened when I was walking him one day and he was killed by a car. And right after that happened, as soon as I got home with his body, if you will, um, then everything started happening. Um, and, I, and I used to keep a journal, a diary, and that diary became really the foundation for my first book because I was cataloging all of the different ways that he was communicating with me. And I thought, if he can do this, other people's pets can do that. And I need to share this with them so that they learn what to look for. In what ways was he communicating with you? Well, um, I, I heard a, a bark when there was no dog around um, in, in the house. Um, he, uh, he communicated with musical signs. I've learned, and, and as I've grown and learned, I've learned there's no such thing as a coincidence when it comes to spirit. So the, the minute I walked in the door, and, and his little body was outside and we put it in the back of my truck to take to the vet. Um, there was nobody else home. And I, I lived with a roommate who was at work all day and I did not have the radio on, but the radio was on when I came in and it was playing the dance by Garth Brooks, which is a song about a man who loved intensely for a short period of time, was grateful for it. And then somebody went away <clears throat> and that was a big sign to me. Um, Buzz also appeared uh, in full color. Um, one of my favorite stories of Buzz's appearances was that he loved to chew on sneakers when he was alive. And my roommate, whom became um, somewhat uh, aggravating after a while, <laughs> um, my Buzz didn't like him. So when he was coming out of the house one day, he ran out screaming because he said he saw a sneaker move from one side of the hallway to the other. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> so wow. I said, good boy, Buzz. <laughs> That's freaky. Wow. Okay. That could scare anybody. <clears throat> you know, you see in this book, um, you're talking about the animal intelligence. By the way, we're talking about this book, Pets and in the Afterlife, okay? And uh, this is Rob Ruth's book. Um, you say that dogs have the ability to interpret and process human language and respond to both spoken commands and hand gestures. Mm -hmm. uh, they sense human emotions. They can comprehend when we're upset. I think we all kind of sense that, but you say um, border collies, for instance, have been, been known to understand as many as 1,000 words. Yes. And exactly. that's a vocabulary that exceeds that of a typical four-year-old child. That's, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's fascinating, <clears throat> all the studies that people have done with dogs. Um, and Dr. Stanley Corrin is the gentleman that I, I cite in my books because he's written a couple of books about the intelligence of dogs and how dogs think. Those are the two titles. Um, and it, it's fascinating. And there's different ways that they, um, that animals, our pets can appear to us. And one of the things you talk about are doppelgangers. What are doppelgangers? I'm just going to turn my sound up here. They're, they're lookalikes. So that's one of the ways that, that actually Buzz actually um, let me know that he was around. And usually they will let us, they, they will lead us to a pet that looks like them when we're thinking about them or it's a special, a special occasion. So back in 2009, my partner and I were on vacation. We went to Puerto Rico. We went to San Juan for the first time ever. And when we were in Puerto Rico, um, <clears throat> we had to make a choice about which direction to go. We, we didn't know where we were, <laughs> really. So I felt nudged to go down one street. So we went down the end of that street and there was a dog walker. And that dog walker <clears throat> had a whole bunch of dogs. I think there was probably eight. <clears throat> Most of them were little dogs, but there was one Weimaraner who looked exactly like Buzz. And when I saw the dog, I, I heard Buzz in my head say, Dad, do you know what day it is? And I thought, what day is it? Then I realized it was the four-year anniversary of his passing to the day. Oh. So birthdays, anniversaries, and holidays are times that our pets will come around, just like people. Because they sense our emotional energy is elevated on those days. And when we're happy, they want to be around us. <laughs> right. 
Yeah, and, you know, and and likewise, how does it affect animals on the other side when we can't get out of our grieving when we're we're stuck in pain? That's a great question. They really want us to move past the grief, and they uh, they want us to understand that mm -hmm. their life lifetime was short, but they came into our lives to give us the gift of unconditional love. And we have to use that gift sometimes at the end of their life to help make them make the decision to help them pass out of pain. And that's also something that people feel guilty about, but pets don't want us to feel guilty about that either, because it means that we learn that ultimate lesson. Um, what, instead, what they would like us to do is to use that love that we had for them and perhaps adopt another pet and bring that other pet into the home. It, and they know it's not replacing them. You can't replace anybody. Um, they know that it's just using the love that you have to help another. Yeah, um, you know, I know you talk about in this book how, you know, the animals really, um, they thank you. They thank their owners for the, uh, the selflessness of helping them pass on, you know, because that's mm -hmm. a very hard thing to do. Um, but we do it, you know, pet owners do it because they don't want the animal to suffer, but it's a, it's a huge sacrifice for the owner. Yeah, ab absolutely. It's a very traumatic thing. And, and scientifically, there are, there have been studies, uh, psychological studies that explain why this is so traumatic. And that is, is because we raise our pets just like we would raise our children. We, we take them to school. We take them to the doctor, the vet when they're sick. Um, we teach them how to play well with others. We, um, we have play time, we have snack time. We, we do exercises with them. We, um, we have regimented schedules that they adhere to. We do fun things with them. Like we take them on rides. Um, you know, we, we, our three dogs, when you say you want to go for a ride, they are right there at the door. <laughs> Um, but the only difference is, and we look at them as children because they have the intelligence of a three to five year old child, but their body ages and their body ages quickly. And usually by 15 or 16 or whatever, um, they are at the end of their lifetime, but they still behave like three to five year old children. Yeah. And to us, we still look at them that way. And to lose a child is the most traumatic thing thing anybody could ever experience right. so that's why that that's why it's so difficult for us when we lose a pet yeah they are like children to us uh, they sleep with us sometimes and you yeah. know they're our buddies when we don't feel well and there's so much there's such a deep connection some people say that animals don't have souls oh come on <laughs> we know that we know that <laughs> we know that they do um and um yeah, can you talk a little bit about that? Like, sure. How do we know they have souls? <laughs> yeah, that's that. That truly is the most ridiculous thing people have ever said to me. Um, so, uh, and, and I'm not the only one. There are other scientists who have felt the same way. So, what is a soul? And this is something that I define in all my books. A soul really is the the physical energies within us. If you think about blood pumping, if you think about cell splitting, if you think about thoughts as little electrical impulses, those combine with our memories, our personality, and the knowledge of this life. And that's really what makes up a soul. And then when we die, we have a choice of staying here earthbound, and I call that a ghost, or we cross over into the light or heaven or paradise, whatever you want to call the other side. And that's a spirit to me. That's what I call a spirit. There's a big difference there. Because ghosts are stuck in a fixed location. They can only communicate from that location. Spirits can come to you anywhere, anytime. Like Buzz communicated with me in Puerto Rico. Um, so everything has a soul. And uh, in my books, I cite a study by a neuroscientist, Dr. Gregory Burns, who wrote a great book about uh, studying a dog's brain and their emotional responses. He used MRIs to scan a dog's brain when the pet parent went up to the dog versus complete strangers, he found that a dog shows the same reaction in the caudate section of their brain. It lights up when, when they show love and affection. And it doesn't when a stranger comes to them. 
So he has proven that dogs have the same emotions that humans do. Because he was also tired of hearing dogs don't have souls. I mean, they're not mindless zombies. <laughs> so, no. so yeah. No, I so think I think all animals have souls. They do. You know, they do. Everything. Every, every living thing has a soul. Mm -hmm. You know, as as much as it pains me to think of, you know, squashing a spider, uh, you know, that's hanging over. I mean, it does have a soul. Mm -hmm. it, it's living energy. Um, you know, I try to help them out instead of do that. Right, but right. You know, sometimes I tell sometimes I tell them, listen. You know, if you stay outside, I don't care. But when you mm -hmm. come into my house, you know, sometimes I, I, I have to do things I don't want to do. But I try to help them out, too. Yeah. See, we, we are so in sync. <laughs> and I live, I mean, I live in South Florida, so we have lizards. And um, they oh, come yeah. in the house, but I love lizards. So, you know, everybody's like, Mandy, there's a lizard. Okay, no problem. I'll get them. I get a cup. I get them in there. And we take them outside. I said, you you can't you have, you're gonna live out here now <laughs> That's awesome. um but yeah i mean i i love animals i love lizards i love everything so um you know we hear about this rainbow bridge which can be very very comforting to a lot of people the rainbow bridge that where our pets cross when they pass on have you seen any evidence of the rainbow bridge um, no, I haven't, but that's not to preclude me from using the, uh, the image of a rainbow bridge on my last two books, Pets in the Afterlife 3 and 4, because it's a, it's a visual thing for us humans who are left behind that gives us a comfort. And, and some mediums will also say too, that, you know, you can picture your dog, we can picture your dog or your, or your people sitting on a park bench in a beautiful setting with the sun setting behind them. And I never, I, I don't get that. Um, they, and, and I don't also don't get the uh, messages that people have jobs or dogs have jobs or cats have jobs on the other side because they're energy. I think the other side from what I've learned from talking to people and pets on the other side is in something we couldn't conceive. I mean, we can't conceive being a ball of energy, really. <laughs> so, right. So we just give these images to people because it's comforting. Yeah, I think that I think the Rainbow Bridge concept is very comforting mm -hmm. to picture our little babies, you know, running happy and playing and everything. When the last time we saw them, they were so sick and lethargic. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so you talk about Sprite. You tell the story about Sprite. So tell us what, you tell us the story. Sure. Uh, so Sprite was a little dachshund that we adopted uh, from a rescue, from a dachshund rescue. Uh, he came to us as a senior. He was 10 years old. Um, we had him for six and a half years after that. And um, he was a little dachshund mix and he was very cute, uh, very laid back. The poor thing was actually the, uh, uh, um, an image of abuse when he came to us because his teeth were so rotted mm -hmm. that when I picked him up an hour away from where we live, I had in December, I had to drive with the windows down because it was, it would, this, the odor would make me gag. Oh my gosh. So, okay. so when, when we got him home, we got him to the vet, he had 22 teeth removed. I just can't imagine how painful that is for a dog. Um, so, Anyway, he, he lived a great life and he liked to amble around because he, he was he was kind of, kind of a chunky little dachshund. Um, that said, after Spike passed away, he sent us a sign that was pretty amazing. And it was proof to me that spirits can manipulate things or influence things in nature like birds and butterflies and, and dragonflies. But when you see those those it doesn't necessarily mean that they're a sign from spirit unless you can link it to a passing a birthday an anniversary a holiday or some other event that's related to them okay so when sprite passed it was july 8th 2013. it's amazing that you you know you remember their birthdays and their passing dates yeah. um we were out in the backyard <clears throat> with our other dogs and a yellow and black butterfly came in the backyard for the first time all summer this was july 
we had butterfly bushes that weren't doing their job. <laughs> so I have two of those. <laughs> do they work? Uh uh. No. <laughs> Not doing anything. No. So we we at, after uh, the day of the day spray passed, we went out in the backyard after we were with the dogs, and there was a yellow and black butterfly that appeared. And that yellow and black butterfly lingered for about 15, 20 minutes, and it was it followed the ground the same way Sprite would. Hmm. Now we have dachshunds and I had a Weimar honor and they would all chase butterflies and squirrels and birds and everything. They didn't move. They just went on about their business, just as if it were Sprite himself that were walking around. So I, I, I took that to be a sign from Sprite. Well, a couple of years later, on July 8th, there was another sighting of a yellow and black butterfly in our backyard. It was the anniversary of his passing. Um, and then I was going to work one day and I wasn't thinking about anything. It was 7.30 in the morning and a yellow and black butterfly came right up past my windshield. And then I realized, oh my gosh, it's July 8th. That's a sign that Sprite is still with us. And um, <clears throat> here's a picture of Sprite. That's my favorite picture of Sprite. <laughs> Little Sprite. How, how, um, how old was he when he passed? 16 and a half. Mm. Well, you know, that's, that's a good long life for an animal. I, you know, I never had a dog that lived that long. Why do I have ghosts? It's you. <laughs> You're bringing ghosts. In. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Appar we have apparitions in the room. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it would be you. Um, so that was Sprite. Let's see, what, who do I have here now? Oh, so, okay. It, um, it, you, talk about, you talk about his message to you. Squeedy Mouse. Oh, right, right. <laughs> that was, yeah, that was my nickname for him because he would, he would um, kind of grunt. And we, <laughs> we used to call it a squeet. <laughs> Aw. So, because it, it, what's actually funny is that um, when he would grunt um, and my in-laws would be over, it, my father-in-law had the same kind of grunt, so we didn't know if it was Sprite or my father-in-law. <laughs> so every now and then, when nobody was in the house, other than our other dogs that don't do that, we would hear his little squeaks, if you will. Wow. Were. Yeah. <laughs> so interesting. So People may hear barks or meows, but always coming uh, like they're coming from another room, but they're actually really right right near near them. So, do our pets tend to uh, come to us in similar behaviors? It sounds like it to to how they lived with us. Yeah, they do. That whatever they did in the physical, they will do from spirit to let us know they're around. So. Mm. Um, I know that our, our we have three dogs now and one dachshund, two dachshund mixes since our wine passed. And one of our dachshund mixes loves to scratch on the door, like to come in, or he likes to scratch on the treat do drawer um, to let us know what he wants. And um, a, a friend of mine lost her boxer. And she said that at the day after or the week after they lost their boxer, their boxer used to like to go up to the outside door and scratch on the door to come in if the, if the dog was outside. So she said her husband was in the kitchen and her, his, his wife and uh, the other dog were asleep upstairs and he heard the dog scratching on the door. So he knew his dog was in spirit right there. <clears throat> you know, that's so comforting. Um, the question, there's a question here. If a pet's spirit leaves their body immediately when they die, how can a pet owner keep the spirit of the pet close to them, especially if the pet dies at the vet's office and not home? Ah, good question. Well, <clears throat> really, it's all about love. So if we think about the emotion of love, like an energetic, emotional spider web, if you will, it connects us no matter where we are. So usually when a pet passes, even at a vet's office, doesn't matter where they pass, they're always connected to us. They, they can find us because our love is a beacon for them. So 
I've had questions from people who said, well, I'm moving out of the house my pet grew up in. I'm afraid they won't be able to find me. And that's not true. It's because the love you have for them in your heart acts like that call, that beacon. So no need to worry there. So it doesn't matter. So it's not, I mean, location is just something that's here on earth. It's not something that, um, that spirits or souls can, they don't relate to that at all. Right. <clears throat> Yep, it's uh, so once they cross, they can find us anywhere. But if if a person or a pet chooses to say earthbound is a ghost, they can't go from where they are. But I've found that about 99% of pets will cross over because our loved ones in spirit, humans, or other pets that preceded them will be waiting for them in the light to help them over. What would and keep what would what would make a, a pet stay earthbound? I mean, I, I can think of reasons why humans would want to stay earthbound, but why would a dog or cat want to? It's very rare. Uh, yeah. The only reasons that I found is that they were very devoted to their pet parent and they were distracted after they passed and they wait too long. For some reason, you know, we, we don't know how long it is, but however long it is, that they wait, they seem to, seem to get stuck there. Mm -hmm. um, it happened when I went to a museum in England, <laughs> Sir John Soane's museum, he was an architect. And when I walked in the door, there was a little dog running around in, in spirit, as it turned out. I thought he was a real dog at first. Really? And <laughs> as I walked mm -hmm. through, um, I had asked somebody if there's a dog in there and they said, no. <laughs> um, and then I, I happened to come across a painting of, Mrs. Johnson, a huge painting with this little black and tan dog that was exactly the one that I saw. Wow. Then I asked the people that work there, is there a little black and tan ghost dog running around? And they said, yes, everybody has seen it that works here. Really? <laughs> yeah. Do you think they stay if their owners stay or, you know, is, is it related to that at all? Um, sometimes they would. Um, but in this case, this little dog stayed because her <clears throat> her owner was still alive. Okay. And when her owner passed and crossed over, she stayed. And the reason she stayed is because she loves going to the door and greeting people when they come mm -hmm. in. And that's what she did to me when I walked in. So she's still doing it, even in the afterlife. She did not want to cross over when I was you there. Didn't. Did you try to help her? I did. But she was like... Mm -mm. It's like when you try to give a dog a treat, they don't want to turn their head. <laughs> no, she did not want to cross over. Hmm. That's so interesting. Um, uh, you talk in here, you talk in your book about, um, you know, the ashes of our pets. <laughs> my, um, we had a relative, actually my daughter's relative from, <clears throat> from my first marriage, but uh, they died and they had a dog that they absolutely loved and uh loved to the point of absurdity but um <laughs> i mean they would take it into rolls royce and have pictures taken it was really kind of crazy oh anyway God. they loved this dog and um when he died they had his they had him cremated hmm. well, i didn't know any of that because i really wasn't in touch with these people but when uh when the last person died uh, my, my daughter had inherited everything from this person and she lived in a different state. I'm here. My husband and I went and we started getting rid of everything. We had to clear the place out and we wow. came upon these ashes. <laughs> like, okay, they're gone. What do I do with these ashes? So I call up the um, mausoleum. Mm -hmm. I said, can, can you put these ashes in with them? And they said, no, the health department does not allow us to do that. I said, okay, so what are we going to do? So my husband and I decided, all right, well, there's like a closet outside of the condo where the water heater is and the air conditioning. We're going to stick it back there somewhere. <laughs> okay, but we hadn't gotten around to it. We had this hauling company come out and they were clearing out everything, clearing out everything. And then I looked to see where the ashes were. And they were gone. They went with a hauling company. I felt, oh, my gosh. I felt so bad. <laughs> like, but, you know, listen, the owner should have planned of where, where those ashes were going to go and not left it up to somebody like me and, you know, mm -hmm. to to make that kind of mistake. But that was it was like, oh, sorry. <laughs> 
Well, you don't don't feel badly about it. Because <laughs> ashes are really just remnants of the physical, and and the the dog isn't there. The, um, but uh, you know, I, it's really they, we really keep them more for us. It's just like you know, nobody. I don't know too many people that have the ashes of their loved ones in their house anymore. They used to do that in what the eighteen hundreds and the early nineteen hundreds. Um, uh, but ashes, if you do have them, and we have the ashes of our four dogs, because our plan and our will says when we're cremated, we want them all mixed in together with us. Oh. And then we want to be spread out somewhere. Okay. So you made a plan. That's good. We do have a plan. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. So I, I urge people to, <laughs> people who are watching and listening to make a plan because, um, like, like you, I mean, you, you have to wonder, oh my gosh, what am I supposed to do with these? Right, exactly. <laughs> it was in this beautiful little closet and you opened up the door and like, we didn't know what we were finding when we, it was like, oh my God, that's, <laughs> that's the ashes of Emmett. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and it's the same thing with a grave for people, isn't it? I mean, they're not there, right? No, they're not. <clears throat> um, so the only time that, uh, that people will appear and 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 uh, when you go to a cemetery is when you go there they nobody lives in a cemetery dead or alive doesn't matter um but when you go there you're bringing positive emotional energy you're bringing the emotional energy of love and love faith and hope are emotional energies that power up if you will spirits who've crossed over to come visit us so when you go there and you are feeling love and and um, in your heart, you give them the ability to materialize. And in some instances, I've read cases and I've seen photographs uh, of like one mother of a of a son who was in the military was killed in I think Iraq. She went to the gravesite and suddenly there was a swarm of dragonflies only around his grave, and she took a picture of it. And that was a sign from her son that he was acknowledging her visiting his grave. Wow. Wow. So let's talk about um, Ruthie Larkin and her beloved Boston. Boston was a, what kind of, was this a, a Shih Tzu or? A, yeah, that's what it was. Okay. Yep. Boston was a Shih Tzu. Um, <clears throat> So Ruthie Larkin is a, is become a really good friend of mine, and we've done we've done a number of investigations together. And um, she she lives in Boston. She's known as the Beantown Medium up there. And she uh, she had a, a dog Boston that she was very close to. And when Boston passed, Boston started to come through to her, just like a couple of other friends of mine, Troy Klein and Bart Mallon. And uh, so when I was writing my Pets in the Afterlife book, I contacted all three of my, my friends who um, were mediums to ask them if they had any experiences. And they did. Um, so you'll find those experiences in the, in the book and they share exactly how their pets came through. Hmm. Right. You had another medium, Troy Klein, who shares the story of Pete's, Pete. And <clears throat> right, so you've got a couple of these stories. Um, cats, you, you make a distinction between dogs and cats. You I said, do. Of course, cats have individual personalities. Well, yeah, they do. Um, so why do you make that distinction? Well, um, cats tend to be more self-sufficient than dogs, which means that <clears throat> dogs are much more, more so around us all the time than cats. Cats, <clears throat> cats have perfected independent living, <laughs> if you will. Yeah, they are independent. <laughs> yeah, so you can, you know, you can go on vacation and you can leave food and water for a cat for a couple of days and they'll be okay. But you can't leave a dog in the house more than four, four or five hours, right. you know, without having to take them out. So, so that's the that's really the distinction is that dogs develop more of, uh, for the most part, more of a an emotional attachment to us. But there are a lot of cats that I have found and that I've read that actually behave like dogs. So, and they will share that with me. Um, so whenever I do a reading um, for people, I ask for a photograph and the name of the, the pet and any questions they may have. Um, and, and of course their names. 
and that's it. And the, when the pet comes through, they usually tell me all kinds of things. Like, I I like to walk with my my parent, or I like to sleep on a pillow and play with their hair at night. I've Aww. had some, some do that. And people have reported feeling like something on their hair at night when they're, they're sleeping on their pillow, mm -hmm. and it's their cat <laughs> in spirit. Wow. Um, That's so, sweet. So they they do they like you mentioned earlier they do behave the same way in spirit as they do in life. Yeah, I I um I grew up with dogs, and I haven't had dogs in many years, but uh, there came a time where I wanted something and I, I ended up with leopard geckos and then I had bearded dragons. Oh, wow. Lizards. And um, because I'm very empathic, um, I can see the soul of any animal. So I look in their eyes and I connect, you know, mm -hmm. so I really loved these animals and everything. And when each one of them died, it was just like losing a dog or a cat to me. Um, as a matter of fact, the, the vet, I had a vet who would write me these condolence cards and tell me how sorry they were. And I have their, their little feet uh, in cement and I have that framed and everything like that. They meant a lot to me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I wonder if lizards, you know, well, are there, are they going to greet me? And, and, and I thought, well, anything that we love really, isn't that kind of what it is, is the energy of love? Absolutely. Yeah. That, that's that's what connects us. So yes, your your lizards will all be there waiting for you. <laughs> Sounds like um, I have a lot. <laughs> I had a lot of them. <laughs> I had, yeah, I had a, I had a lot of them. Um and yeah, they they were my babies. Like bearded dragons are just like cats and they they like to snuggle. I would take naps with them and you know, they're just really very docile. Oh wow. That, yeah, they're that's they're very cool. Yeah. <laughs> They're very cool. They're, they're really laid back. People carry them around on their shoulders and everything. And they just, they just hang out, you know. Um, so then you talk in here about horses and birds. I had a horse whisperer on here one, one time. And I was amazed at what she told us about horses and how much they know and how much they communicate. Have you communicated with horses? I have. Uh, yeah, a couple of them. Um, and they really, they really do. Um, they they communicate much like like much like dogs do and cats um they're able to share the emotions they're very aware of what's going on um they're also very emotional and you know people wouldn't think that of a horse i mean right you know when you look at old western movies of cowboys riding horses you you look at them as horses you look at them in a utilitarian way but they're they're not they're actually loving caring animals mm -hmm. so um and and they do come back in many ways to let us know um one of my uh one of my favorite stories was from a gentleman that uh, that came to me during a talk i gave in a, in a library recently about um uh, pets in the afterlife and he said that he had a number of horses in a barn and his favorite horse passed away and he was grieving over the loss of his favorite horse and in the barn, when he was with the other horses, he heard the distinct whinny of the horse that passed away outside the barn. So he said he kept hearing it and he quickly put his other horses in their stable and he ran outside to look. And he said, I didn't expect to see anything anyway, but, but I heard my favorite horse. Mm. And he said, there was nothing there, but it, it warmed my heart to know that, that my favorite horse is still around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I remember um, this, the horse whisperer saying that, there, th that this animal, this horse was sick and nobody could figure out what was wrong. And it told her what was wrong. You know, it, it said, this, I'm hurting. This is where it's hurting. Um, you know, I'm suffering. And uh, I think it had something to do with his mouth and a place where they hadn't looked. And uh, he actually communicated with her and told her what was wrong. But she was That's saying a fantastic they, they, gift. they have, you know, conversations with each other, the horses, they're, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating. So um, I, I wish I could be an animal communicator. So an animal communicator is different from what I do because I only communicate with pets and people who pass, but animal communicators can communicate with living animals. Mm -hmm. 
that's a different gift than what I have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It's very interesting. Um, and in chapter 14, it's called Pets Can Sense Ghosts and Spirits. Well, yeah, mm. I, I mean, yeah, they'll react to anything that uh, things we can't see, right? Yeah, so there's a uh, there is a scientific reason why they can see <clears throat> ghosts and spirits. So dogs and cats have a different physiology in their uh, sight and their hearing. They have different cones and rods in their eyes. And those cones and rods configured uh, enable them to see faster movement. And as a paranormal investigator, we use high-speed cameras to catch images of earthbound ghosts or spirits who are visiting. Um, but dogs and cats can see that faster movement without technology. Interesting. So that's why they can see it. In terms of uh, their ears, they can hear at different frequencies than humans can. So if you think of a dog whistle, we can't hear a dog whistle when it's blown, but dogs can, and, and even cats can. Um, as a paranormal investigator, we have to use a digital recorder that records at different frequencies in order to pick up a ghost voice or a spirit voice. And we have to play it back to hear the answer. Even though, even though we're recording, we don't hear the answer. We have to play it back. <laughs> so, so dogs and cats can hear it right when it's said. Right. Well, um, I mean, it, you know, if if they if they pass on to a different dimension, from what I understand, it's a dimension that vibrates faster than ours, mm -hmm. right? So, um, you know, and so we we wouldn't be able to see or hear, even though it could be happening right where we are. You know, exactly. the dimension right. is right on top of us. We can't see or hear it. Right. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. um, but dogs and cats can see it. So for the for the people who are listening, if you are if you have a dog or cat that passed and you still have another dog or cat living in your home, if your living pet is focused on a certain area staring, for instance, and there's nothing there, not a bug, not uh, anything else, um, make note of the date and check if it's a, a birthday anniversary or holiday or passing date or something. And if that's the case, then it's very likely that your pet in spirit is visiting. That's so cool. Do they do do they do some of the same things that um, that human loved ones who have passed do, like flicker the lights or play songs or stuff like that? Yeah, they they do, and they actually get help too from people on the other side. Mm. So, uh, um, you may, for instance, you may find a coin with the year that your pet passed many years ago. And it's not that your pet knows what a coin is <laughs> or can read the year, but they're connected to a spirit of one of your loved ones who does know what a coin is. And the pet wants you to know that they're still around. So the human loved one in spirit will find a coin and throw it in front of you. And you'll you'll see that year on them. So years are very important when it comes to coins and messages. <laughs> And they can also affect energy, lights and things like that. Yeah, they can because as so as energy, <clears throat> couple of memories, personality, and knowledge, they can affect um, electricity, and they can play with it. Um, they can turn your TV off. <laughs> they can turn <laughs> your radio on. <laughs> uh, there's a number of things they can do. Um, I, I have a. My I have a funny story with my mom. After my dad passed, he liked to play with the hallway light out just outside of her bedroom. And it never had a problem until after he passed. And then it would flicker whenever she left her room. And she had it checked out by three electricians. And they all said, there's nothing wrong with it. So when I used to call her every day after my dad passed, she would she would start cussing at the light <laughs> and, and, and calling my father's name and telling him to cut it out. And <laughs> and it's it, it's just Dad's way of letting him letting you know he's still around. Right. Was, kind was of he was he a little bit annoying with her in like? No, he, he liked to tease her sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So he was <laughs> continuing that personality in death. Yeah, and um, I've had a couple of reading readings with mediums, and in, I think in one in particular, my dogs were with my loved ones who had crossed. So do they really? They come and they help them cross over. Your loved ones? They do. they do. Yeah, they absolutely. So when, when the loved ones are there, 
are are like ready to pass, they will see not only people, but they will also see some of the pets that that have passed. And that that happened um, in the case of my uh, my mom. Um, but I had to tell her she was in a she was in a coma after having a heart attack, or I mean a stroke rather. And my dad came into the room in spirit, holding her favorite dog. Aww. And um, I, I had my dad said to me, "Tell your mother that I'm here." Uh, with her dog Gigi and we're waiting for her and and I did that and then my dad said please leave the room you and your brothers leave the room and and she'll pass and we left the room for the first time in a couple of days and she passed within five hours mm -hmm. knowing that her dog was on the other side I don't know about my dad being on the other side but she passed knowing her dog was on the right. other side. <laughs> right he can wait <laughs> right right well I'll see him sometime <laughs> yeah I know that's um that's that's so cool. That's so cool. Animals are so special. Um you say if you want to honor the memory of your beloved pet, the best thing you can do is to adopt another who is in desperate need of a home. And um people sometimes say, you know, I, I was led to adopt this other dog, or I somehow I found this dog and I just know it was the my you know my previous dog's gift to me. Mm -hmm. Does that happen? Yeah, absolutely. Quite often. Um, there's one of the stories that I have in Pets in the Afterlife too is about a woman who uh, whose dog um, um, <clears throat> a bullet passed away, <clears throat> and she didn't want another dog, and she was trauma uh, she was traumatized by the loss of her dog, and she said, "I will not get another dog. I can't go through this again." But one day she was driving home and she was passing the SPCA and she said something made me just pull in the parking lot and I found myself saying what am I doing here and then she, th she said I I'm, I'm here I might as well go in and walk in and see what dogs they have. <laughs> so she walked down all the aisles and she came to the very last cage and she said I remember crouching down and looking through the cage and I just fell in love with this little dog and she said the dog's name was Trigger and I knew that bullet had brought me bullet and trigger trigger and, and because well they were also the names of the Roy Rogers and Dale Evans horses bullet mm. and trigger um and she said <clears throat> I knew and she adopted the dog and she said the dog has been totally the joy of her life mm -hmm. so they will do that and they're not upset when we when we get another pet right no not at all um they know that we're not replacing them some people have said to me yeah well, I don't want them to feel like I'm replacing them. Well, you're not, you can't replace anybody. Um, you know, unless, unless you're in a work environment, you're just a number, you know, and then <laughs> if you leave, somebody else will come in. But in terms of love, you can't replace a, a love. Um, it's just bringing in a new love and, and helping heal your soul and the soul of the pet that you adopt. Hmm. That's good to know. Because it can be very comforting and, you know, help us to get through the grieving process if we bring in another pet to love. Yeah, absolutely. And and sometimes they will, when I do readings, they're kind of funny. They will, I've had some dogs and cats say, well, um, it's okay to adopt another cat, but I want you to adopt a male cat because I want to be the only female in the house. <laughs> <laughs> really? They do that? Yeah. Yeah, they've done that. Yep. <laughs> hmm. And what if they couldn't communicate? What if you weren't there to communicate? They'd be really disappointed. Would they would they kind of cause problems? Would they cause a ruckus if you got the wrong animal? Um, they would actually find a way to lead them to a female cat. Um, and uh, in the case I can I can relate that to the case of a dog. A woman said that she had a um a white dog with black spots. And she said after a dog passed, she never wanted to adopt another dog white dog with black spots because she wanted that to be the only dog with white and black spots and so she went to adopt another dog who was a brown medium-sized dog and they were very close to adopting they went to the shelter to get the dog <clears throat> and somebody else had claimed the dog um so the next dog they brought out was a white dog with black spots <laughs> and that's because their dog in spirit wanted them to adopt one similar so that they would know their other dog in spirit is still always with them. Hmm. 
kind of weird how that works, but that's spirits are funny. So that dog spirit interfered with the first one, made sure yep. they got, that's incredible. That yes, really, I mean, that, that they have such a strong will or strong personality or strong desires that carry over into spirit. So interesting. Yeah, they can do anything. <laughs> Apparently so. Yeah. And then you talk about reincarnation. You know, people say, oh, you know, I don't want to come back as a, you know, I don't want to come back as a rat or I don't want to come back as a, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, how does that work? How does reincarnation work? Or do animals stay as animals and people stay as people? How does that work? Think about my experience. Um, so I can't. I don't I don't know the answers, but in my experience, um, animals kind of stay in the animal kingdom <clears throat> and people stay in the human kingdom. Um, and um, they they won't come back during this lifetime. That's my experience. Mm -hmm. They will wait for you in the light. But what they will do is they will come back in this lifetime as a spirit and they will teach your new pet to have a habit or two that they had when they were alive. Oh. So some people have said, well, no, that's my dog reincarnated. And I said, no, it's it's really not. Your dog is actually in spirit, has trained your new dog to do one thing or two things unique that they used to do. Wow. Um, and, and, and in my family, we just adopted a nine-year-old Dachshund Terrier mix. And he has five distinct habits of our dachshund franklin who passed away in 2020 that no other dog i've i've had has he's the only one that's that growls all the time <laughs> he's the only one that knows how to get his leash tangled up under his arm when we walk every <laughs> single time and he's the only one that sits on his his butt and and begs out of all the dachshunds we've had, only Franklin has done all three of those things. And this dog does all three of those things. And we know that Franklin is the one that led us to this little guy so that we would know that he's still around. That is so cool. So cool. So, you know, so you think, in your opinion, humans or people reincarnate as humans. And it's not like we go, we're not going to become animals and animals are not going to become humans. Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, I, I think that we stay in the uh, the human kingdom. Um, and a joke that I always make is that if you see your coworker licking their hand like a cat, <laughs> then you know what they were. <laughs> That's right. But I haven't seen that yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, when I think of, you know, I'm vegetarian, vegan, and because um, I just can't stand the thought of killing mm -hmm. an animal for me to eat it. Yeah. And, and, and it really bothers me. Like if I drive past, um, you know, like we have these ranches here in Florida and, you know, cattle ranches or whatever. And I know what's going on in those ranches. It's so upsetting to me. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, somebody once said, you know, I asked the, this question to somebody else and they're like, well, they know that their life here is, it's a sacrificial one for the benefit of other people, but I don't know. I just have a real hard time understanding that. Do you have a feeling, an opinion on that? Well, I think that we all know before we come here, <clears throat> but we don't really realize that when we're born. I mean, we we know what, before we, before we come here, we choose the life that we're going to have, the kind of life we're going to have, and, and the challenges that come with it. Uh, that's what I understand, but I think once we get here, we don't remember that we agreed to do this. Mm -hmm. So for these animals, it could be very distressing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very traumatic. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I hope I live to see the day when they stop killing animals for human consumption. I really, some people love their meat. I, I just can't even understand that. So, um, so we're talking about your book pets in the afterlife is there anything else that um you wanted to share I kind of went through the whole book but um anything else you want to share it, um just that the reason i wrote all of these pets in the afterlife books are to teach people how to recognize signs on their own 
so that they don't need a medium. Um, and, and pets communicate in so many different ways. Um, you just have to really pay attention. And, and as we talk, discussed earlier, that they do things that they did in life. Um, you may see a shadow in one of the places that they used to like to sit, just a quick moving shadow. Um, or you may hear, you may hear uh, nails on the floor at night. Um, sometimes uh, I've heard uh, from dogs that they like to snore at night when their <laughs> parents are going to sleep oh. and they're sorry for their snoring. Oh. Um, going to grab something while you're talking. Sure. Um, other times pets, if you put them on the bed, you may feel a, a pressure against your back or your legs, uh, either a cold, a coolness or a pressure. Um, and by the way, scientifically, I can explain cold spots. And that's because as energy, they need energy to get strong enough to solidify, if you will. And they take the motion of um, motion of air molecules. They take that energy of motion and they absorb it. And they slow those air molecules down and slower moving molecules of air are cooler air as faster moving molecules of air are warm air. That's why you feel a cold spot in the presence of a ghost or a spirit. Mm -hmm. But our pets want us to know that they're on the other side, they love us, they guide us. Um, and they're very thankful for the time that we had with, with them. There's something that, you know, I usually go to bed before my husband does and um. And I'm laying there with my eyes closed and I can't always tell if it's him getting in the bed. Sometimes I feel something getting in the bed with me. <laughs> like, what are, you know, and, and, and I just like look at, no, it's not him. There's nothing there. Um, but something is snuggling, snuggling up with me at night. <laughs> I don't know who it is. Could be anybody. It sounds, like, it sounds like I have a whole lot of uh, animal spirits on the other side. <laughs> I have, yeah, or it could be, yeah, people, you know, people spirits, who knows? I, there's a real prankster that, uh, that I have on the other side. So who messes with my lights and uh -oh. <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we're going to have you back on April 4th to talk about ghosts in the bird. Let's see. OK, Oops. ghosts in the bird cage, cage theater. Is that what it's called? Yes, on a medium's vacation. On a medium's <laughs> vacation, OK. <laughs> So we're going to talk about that, and um, so we get to have you back, and we'll talk about another paranormal kind of angle. And sounds great. Yeah, it's been great. It's great talking to you. You too. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. It's fun. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yep. Okay, I'll see you uh, in another month or so. Sounds great. Have a great day. You too. Thank Take you. care. Right. Bye bye. bye.